The best part about doing this show, to me, is guests. And I'm getting you guests, ladies and gentlemen. These are these are not regular people. These are smart individuals, principled, live on fundamentals. And I do it while introducing them to Eminem music. That can't be done. That's very difficult. And today, I'm very proud to have Kevin Kosar. Kevin, uh, before he joined R Street, he was a congressional, or he worked for a congressional research service where he served as an analyst, a research manager. Earlier in his career, he was an elect, a lecturer on, on public policy and administration at New York University and Metropolitan College of New York. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me. I truly appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me on. So the bulk of my show, what I want to do is I've realized, you know, I grew up in Chicago, right? I mean, we're surrounded by skullduggery and incompetence. And not many people even took a civics class or understand how Congress is the most important branch of government. There's a reason the election is every two years. They're supposed to be closest to you. They are supposed to be restrained, not the other way around. And I've been losing this argument, kid, for about 35 years. It's very frustrating. And I'm too old to sing and mm -hmm. dance, so I can't move to Hollywood. So I need to fix things. Please tell me there is a ray of hope. I think there is with Trump breaking everything. What do you think? Yeah, certainly there is. Um, in the last five years, we've seen a movement break out to kind of uh, fix Congress. And it was long overdue. Um, you know, historically, Congress goes through these cycles of major reform. They had one in the middle of the 1940s after you had the kind of growth of government under FDR. Uh, and then they had another one in the early 70s after LBJ and Nixon got kind of out of control. And in the early 90s, they were going to do it again, but it got tied up in politics, so nothing happened. So the situation just kind of festered until about five years ago, and you just had enough people on Capitol Hill and enough members of the public saying, Congress is a wreck. we got to do something. And so stuff is happening, but it's, uh, there's a long way to go. So their approval rating has always been extremely low. I've been fascinated about this. I've been paying attention for many, many years. I mean, their approval rating is ridiculously low, yet their power seems to constantly grow. And I'm going to tell you what, it is to the point now where I feel that laws are being created and written as spears versus shields. How can a citizen and a, or a group of citizens reestablish and fight back while remaining lawful? Can it be done? You know, that's a, that's a good question. There's, a, there's definitely strength in numbers, um, and there's definitely value in communication. And I'm not talking about going to a website and clicking a thing, and it produces one of those automatic, you know, forms that get submitted to your member of Congress. Congressional staff don't pay a whole lot of attention to those. But if you sit down and write a member of Congress, if you telephone a member of Congress, and you are a pest about it, and you threaten to withhold your votes, and you talk out, and you make noise, they, they will respond because members of Congress ultimately want to get reelected. I mean, I'm seeing a, a bunch of Congress people who, whether they're qualified or not, is up to the districts that, that elect them. However, what I'm noticing is the AOCs of the world, the, the, the squad, they literally have the power, and if you align them with a president who believes in massive socialist agenda they have the power to very quickly turn this country i mean you could argue that it's quasi socialist now and i could make that argument but they have the power to truly mm -hmm. enact these things that they're posing as as utopia but we know our venezuelan nazism in, in nature and if that happens see because i'm aware there's going to be a post trump day whether it's a year whether it's five years whatever it is there's going to be a and I, and I don't I don't like his pen use either. How can we? I mean, I thought the Tea Party was going to stick together. They didn't. They're nowhere. Is there an insurgence? Mm -hmm. Are you witnessing? Is there? Do you have optimism in this? You know, if I didn't have optimism, I I just wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. Um, yeah, I have optimism. I mean, we we've seen these kind of waves of government growth wash over this country. I mean, 120 years ago, there was hardly much of a federal government at all, but then we had the progressive revolution. And then things simmered down a little bit, and then we had 
Great Depression and World War II. But then after that, they actually started cutting government because they believed in small government. And Congress was leading the way on that. And they got cooperation from the White House. And then in the 60s, boom, all of a sudden, a whole lot of social uh, legislation and a huge outcropping. And that kind of washed through to the 70s. And then the 80s, Reagan went after it with some limited success. And then it was kind of a, you know, uh, detente yeah. in the 90s. And then, boom, 9-11 happens. And uh, all of a sudden, government growth and government spending started to skyrocket again. All in the name of patriotism. Um, a, That's what bothers me. There's got to be a cr- correction. Oh, yeah. Well, everybody wraps everything in patriotism. Even Trump trying to put the G7 at Doral was saying that he was trying to do the country a favor. <laughs> it's, cra- it's crazy. Uh, but I will say this. I'm intrigued by your other expertise and the books you've written because we are living through it right here in Chicago as we watch the strength of the teachers union cripple not just Chicago, but the state. And you've written two books on it, Failing Grades and the Federal Politics of Education. And, you know, as I think of it, if you think of it from both sides of the coin, the fact that we allowed public education to get this kind of a foothold in our lives, it's really only the natural progression of it why we're here. And the reality is the future is even more bleak as people realize, well, you're giving the first 12 grades away for free. Why not the next four? And mm. isn't the, I mean, if you think mm-hmm. about it, that is the socialist argument. I've been against public school. I have two kids. I never, not a day in public school, yet I've been paying on multiple property taxes. So I didn't like the concept of the two old ladies next door to me paying for my kid. It always made me uncomfortable. But society seems to have grabbed it. Is there a way, do you ever see public education ending? No, I don't see it ending. I mean, I could certainly in the last 20 years, there's been a a serious expansion in the number of uh, options outside the typical public option, what with the growth of vouchers and charter schools. Um, But, and I think that stuff's going to stay around because you have enough people who are just simply fed up with the options that they have uh, gotten from the public systems, particularly in urban areas. Rural areas, it's a lot tougher. I mean, you got a sparser population trying to create a competitor school is, you know, there's just not a market there uh, in many cases. You know, I, I think that one of the big turning points in history that's just little appreciated was that the movement, you know, about 80 years ago where it was decided we're going to unionize government employees. Yeah. Now, government employees were hired on as civil servants. They're not put there for cronyism. They have to take tests and, you know, meet criteria, et cetera, et cetera. They have civil service protections. So you don't get them, you know, you don't get fired when somebody from the opposite political party comes in. You would have thought that was enough to run the system. But no, instead, they also gave in and decided that we're going to let them unionize. And then when you have that, then suddenly you have taxpayer dollars flowing into teacher pockets, which then flows into union coffers, which is then used to, you know, work over legislators, donate to political campaigns, and basically to manipulate the system in a direction that is to their satisfaction. And, yeah, Chicago is a particularly acute case of that. Oh, their thirst for the money is insatiable. I mean, it is something to behold, Kevin, where you have a sympathetic semi-communist mayor trying to negotiate with the Che Guevara teachers union leader. And she's saying yes, and he refuses to take it for an answer. You see that this is a path of destruction. And the reason they only want three-year contracts versus five is they want to do this every three years. And, Kevin, Illinois, I don't know if you're paying attention, people are running like O'Leary's cow kicked the lantern over again. It's just chaos, but <laughs> the rea- I mean, am I Don Quixote to want to destroy the entire public sector of schooling? <laughs> I mean, I, I am, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's now, think about it, it sounds kooky that you're talking to a guy who wants to co- completely eliminate a public school system. But the reality is, you can't, it, history has shown us, we can't get along with it. You, you, you can't reason with it. Yeah, I think one of the things that's going to be interesting to see is places like Chicago, what's going to happen with the pensions? 
I mean, there's only, you know, so many promises that can be made for so many decades, and there's only so much, you know, kind of, put it nicely, optimistic accounting that can get done before the bill comes due, and then somebody's going to get a haircut. I mean, we you know, saw it the, up in Detroit, where they made lots of promises to government employees, promises they had no chance of keeping, but they kept making them because it was politically easy, and then finally it was like, forget it, we're bankrupt. Somebody's got to take a haircut here. Um, and maybe that's what's coming down the pike. Now, you've been around these shapeshifter congressmen for a large part of your life. In the, in the hallways, when they're in the health club working out, when they're making fun of the people, do they understand how bad this is? Or do they just want to not talk about it and not even affiliate themselves with the enclaves of, of Democrat failure that, that we call Chicago, Los Angeles, New Jersey, New York? I mean, is this what's it like in that uh, Caligny, Caligly uh, for nerds called Washington, D.C.? What are they really, are they just like, we don't want to talk about it and we hope you don't? Or is there an effort to say, we better fix this, and I'm hoping that we can? Um, the way I kind of view it is that there are you know, a few different camps. First, they're just the, the, the shysters and the, you know, the ones who want to get their mugs in front of the cameras. Who, that's that's we, kind of their life. We call them Dick Durbin. Um, you could just say Dick Durbin and we'll know what you're talking about. Go ahead. And, and then there are the folks who, like, they actually want to change stuff. And they're frustrated and they're ticked off and they're trying to get stuff done. But they find that Congress just is not a place where things are moving. And then you got the politicos, the people who basically see their entire mission in Washington, D.C., is to get their team, either the Dems or the Republicans, to control the chamber after the next elections. So what do they do over a two-year period or when they're running the Senate? They do everything they can to screw the other side. So even when good bills come along that they might agree upon, if they do a little polling and look around and think that they can get partisan advantage from it, they won't just pass the bill and let the other ter- team share a win. Oh, no, we've got to scuttle the bill. Um, it, it's really tragic. I mean, it's so unfortunate that only a few good pieces of legislation seem to be getting through, like last year's big opioids bill. You know, that was bipartisan. You know, everyone as far as left is Koch brothers, Soros, and as far as right is Koch brothers, and in between, get them together and saying, like, opioids are a problem. We all gain by making, you know, taking action on it. That was good, but these sorts of victories are few and far between, unfortunately. If we don't restrain the money, that the, the dark money, the PAC money, the the pay to play. I mean, let's call it what it is. Nobody's going to give a politician millions of dollars unless they want something. If we don't change that, can we fix it? Or is it just going to ride this thing until we are uh, Venezuelan ourselves in the streets? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's just a brutal truth that if you have a lot of money, you have a way better chance of getting an audience with a member of Congress because these guys are all trying to raise money like crazy so that they can get reelected. I mean, one of the underappreciated truths is that members of Congress, they get beat all the time. People talk about, oh, there's lots of safe districts and this, that, and the other. Last time I checked the numbers a few years ago, more than half members of Congress had only been around eight years. Well, us like, here in Illinois are hoping more. you're right, Kevin, and I hate to cut you short, but um, i got to take a break. Listen, it's been my pleasure, and I hope you join me again. I've really had a good time. Thank you so much for joining us. Love to. Thank you. 312-642-5600. We will be back after the, me- the commercials, messages, whatever. You want whatever. You want 